Okay, um, so uh, first of all, um, my thanks to Lily for the invitation to speak as part of this wonderful event. I am really honored um, to be here. I think this is one of the most interesting, challenging, exciting um, uh, organization of an event that I've been part of in a long time. Um, and of course, it's a preface um, to today as a preface to next week's uh, Counter Technologies at the Edgelands Transborder Conference. So this is a tremendous opportunity for me to deepen my understanding between relations, uh, uh, my understanding of relations between the work that I've been doing on so-called algorithmic warfare in US military operations and developments at the US-Mexico borderlands. So the two images here indicate the different sites that I'm going to try to bring into relation with one another today. So on the left, uh, we have a drone's eye view of a location in Yemen, and on the right, a vision of the cybernetic border as imagined by the Department of Homeland Security, uh, reproduced in a forthcoming manuscript by Ivan Char Lopez. Thinking about my own work on US military operations in conversation with Ivan's book, Cybernetic Borders, um, which will be coming soon, and I'll tell you more about it shortly, has allowed me to see more clearly that we need to move towards an, aver an inversion of current formulations of insecurity. In place of the obsession with an imminent threat that drives US operations, we need to be looking closely at how figures of the threat of the enemy are generated and sustained, and how those cycles that reproduce relations of enmity could be interrupted. So from the patterns of life that are the focus of US counterterror operations abroad to the no-go zones designed to buffer the US-Mexico borderlands, we find methods through which states of insecurity are built and maintained. Now, one more note about my title is that while we're talking about AI at the Edgelands today, I am deliberately staying with the term data analytics rather than AI, which I don't seem able to say without air quotes. <laughs> and I do this as part of a kind of campaign that I'm on against the mystifying power of AI as a signifier, which I think is really best understood as a cover term for new infrastructures of data storage and techniques of data analysis, and I'll come back to that in a moment. So here's a bit of a roadmap um, of the talk overall. I'm gonna begin with this basic question, that is, what are we talking about when we talk about AI? And I'll offer some thoughts on that, along with an exemplary project, Kate Crawford and Vlad and Joler's Anatomy of an AI System, that I think powerfully challenges the common framing of AI as some kind of autonomous entity. I'll then turn to the case of rising investment in algorithmic systems by the US military, and more specifically, the claim for AI's role in enabling gr greater accuracy in the identification of imminent threats. And I'll bring that argument back home in relation to the US-Mexico border, drawing on Ivan Char Lopez's book. And then finally, I'll conclude with some thoughts about how we might resist the promise of technological security in favor of more radical forms of innovation. So what are we talking about when we talk about AI? In the past several years, artificial intelligence has shifted from the name for a subfield of computer science and associated technologies to a widely circulating signifier for something, some thing of great power and inevitability. And as just one of a myriad of examples I could have picked, we have this report from the recent Davos World Economic Forum on remarks by Google Alphabet CEO Sundar Pichai, who made headlines with his assertion that, quote, AI is one of the most profound things that we're working on as humanity. It's more profound than fire or electricity. Now, having made this claim, Pichai then went on to express his concern about the potential risks of AI, this incredibly powerful thing. Um, and and that's, that expression of concern is generally taken as a mark of ethical responsibility. He also, and I appreciate this, called for a move towards some form of international agreement 
on algorithmic systems governance in place of reliance on tech companies to adjudicate the appropriate use of their systems. I want to begin by proposing, though, that whether intentionally or not, statements of the risks of AI that are framed in terms of its great powers primarily serve the interests of those who are AI's promoters by reiterating how powerful it is. As long as statements of risk reinforce the idea that AI is a self-evident and inevitable thing, they are, in my view, inherently irresponsible. They're irresponsible insofar as they obscure the vested interests that underwrite big technology projects, the ongoing investments that are required, and most importantly, the inbuilt problems and limits of algorithmic <coughs> systems. Studies of the history of technology make clear that there is nothing inevitable about technology development. It's human interests and political will that keep technological projects going. That's why, after all, Pichai is at Davos. So what are we talking about when we talk about AI? Here's a kind of working definition. Um, I would say, in the simplest terms, AI is a cover term for a range of technologies of data processing and techniques of data analysis based on the iterative adjustment of relevant parameters according to some combination of internally and externally generated feedback. Now, this definition is not meant to understate the extraordinary scale and complexity of the multidimensional parametric models and the kind of layered architectures of so-called machine learning systems or the exponentially growing speed and storage capacity of the hardware that enables them. But while the admission that, in particular, deep learning algorithms evade human understanding is taken by some to suggest the advent of forms of intelligence superior to the human, an alternative explanation is that these are elaborations of pattern discrimination based not on significance or learning in the human sense, but on computationally detectable correlations that, however meaningless, selectively produce results that are legible to humans. In other words, from training data to the assessment of results, it's humans who inform the input, input and find significance in the output of an algorithmic system's operations. So what could it look like to move away from rep the representation of AI as a thing? Um, here's one example, the project anatomy of an AI system, and you can find this online and you can explore this exploded diagram. It's an initiative by Kate Crawford and Vladin Jurler, um, which creates an exploded diagram of the Amazon Echo. So they start from a single interaction with the device Alexa, which is it's an interaction that's featured in Amazon's promotional video for the Echo, um, the command, Alexa, turn on the hall lights. And, they, and taking that as their starting place, um, they follow out what, what, what is involved in the largest sense in the possibility that Alexa can respond to that um, command. And as they write in the long, uh, this lovely long essay that goes along with this diagram, quote, in this fleeting moment of interaction, a vast matrix of capacities is invoked. Interlaced chains of resource extraction, human labor, and algorithmic processing across networks of mining, logistics, distribution, prediction, and optimization. The scale of the system is almost beyond human imagining. How can we begin to see it, to grasp its immensity and complexity as a connected form? And it's that that, that the exploded diagram and the accompanying essay works to do. So they take us in, a, in an excursion that goes from the lithium reserves of Bolivia and Chile and Argentina to the toxic waste dumps of Asia and across radically unequal distributions of reward. So they observe that a cobalt miner in the Congo would need to work for 700,000 years nonstop to learn the equivalent of a single day of income for Jeff Bezos. <laughs> As they point out, quote, each object in the extended network of an AI system, from network routers to batteries to microphones, is built using elements that required billions of years to be produced. And at the same time, of course, cycles of built-in obsolescence fuel the purchase of new devices and further unsustainable extraction. 
With respect to software, they remind us of the hidden labor, outsourced and crowdsourced, much of the work that Lilly has done, required to animate these systems, particularly in the process of tagging and labeling the thousands of hours of digital archives that are needed to feed the machine learning networks. So the areas of AI investment and mystification that I've been engaged with most directly are initiatives in the automation of US milita military weapon systems designed to identify an imminent threat and to designate targets uh, for the use of force. And so this is gonna be a really quick synopsis of a paper um, that, of mine that's coming out soon in the Ju Journal of Critical Studies on Security um, titled Re Algorithmic Warfare and the Reinvention of Accuracy. But I want to, preface that um, and kind of in the interest of full disclosure by saying that I'm engaged with these issues as a US citizen who believes that actions undertaken in my name or in the name of security for the US homeland are undermining possibilities for peace around the world. Here's a graph showing relative defense spending for 2018, which makes clear that the United States is the overwhelmingly dominant military power. The US defense budget um, now, as we know, over $700 billion exceeds that of the next eight most heavily armed countries in the world, including Russia and China. The U.S. maintains nearly 800 military bases around the world in 70 countries, and yet in this context, we find the continuation of a discourse of U.S. vulnerability, not only in the form of the so-called war on terror, but more recently of a new arms race between the U.S., China, and Russia centered on the figure of artificial intelligence. So this image um, that I started with is a frame from a full motion video taken by a drone positioned over an, over an area being surveilled by the US military. And the image accompanied an article in The Guardian um, titled The Kill Chain Inside the Unit That Tracks Targets for US Drone Wars, which describes the distributed system of drone operators, video analysts, and associated military personnel who look for persons deemed to be threats to the US homeland. So the image is a drone's eye view of a desert area in Yemen, one of the locations named by the US military areas of active hostilities. The box, the red box indicates an object, uh, in this case it's a building, automatically identified as a prospective target. And plans for automating the analysis of drone footage were highlighted in April of 2017 when the DOD initiated its flagship AI project, the Algorithmic Warfare Cross-Functional Team, uh, codename Project Maven. And I should say that that logo is actually the logo of this project. Um, I have yet to do a, <laughs> a, 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 a genealogy of, of this logo, but I think it's fantastic. The announcement of Project Maven by then Deputy Secretary of Defense Robert Work um, asserted the need to, quote, turn the enormous volume of data available to the DOD in the form of full motion video into actionable intelligence and insights at speed. In other words, there's now such an enormous store of full motion surveillance video that it's effectively useless because it's impossible for anyone to actually um, analyze it. So the plan, as work sets it out in this memo, includes an initial project focused on the task of labeling data within video images generated by US drone surveillance operations as a step toward establishing the algorithms and the infrastructures needed to automate um, object detection and classification and alerts with respect to imminent threats in the service of weapons targeting. And in June of 2018, uh, the DOD joined, launched the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, or JAKE, with the former head of Project Maven, um, pictured here, Lieutenant General Jack Shanahan as its first director, and Shanahan then was quoted um, as saying that 2020 would be a quotes, breakout year for AI and weapon systems with the biggest project being, quote, what we are calling AI for maneuver and fires. So the questions surrounding Project Maven include very centrally the criteria by which objects are identified as potential targets for the use of force. But there's tremendous secrecy surrounding this project. So all we know is that the trial system focused on some 38 classes of objects, that they had an initial data set of 150,000 images that were hand-labeled um, for, the, for the training set, 
but a Freedom of Information Act uh, request um, was met by a response from the Defense Department who claimed that all 5,000 documents related to Project MAVEN possess, quotes, critical infrastructure security information and so couldn't be released. So we know, we know very little about the, the assumptions um, that inform this project. But a growing body of investigative reporting and scholarship provides us with grounds for questioning the basis for targeting and claims for accuracy in US counterterrorism operations. So this is what we know is already informing these operations. And this would be the basis for the automation of these systems. And we can get a good sense of the problem in this rendering of, of so-called precision airstrikes um, carried out by the US and coalition military in Pakistan. So this is from 2004 to 2015. And the, the visualization graphs 3,341 fatalities. And this is um, data collected largely by the Bureau of uh, Investigative Journalism. So 3,341 fatalities from every known drone attack during that period. So the frequency of strikes is rendered above the midline. And you can see there's a, a surge in strikes around 2009 um, when President Obama took office. Uh, and then the count of persons killed is rendered below the line. So if we read um, the coded band um, across the top, uh, we can see that there's a, very, there's a bright red strip on the far left, which is the 190, or 5.7% of victims who were positively identified as children. And then a crimson band, um, a somewhat larger band of crimson, the 534 or 16% of those killed identified as civilians. So this is the roughly 25% of the people who were killed who were actually identified as being not legitimate targets, so-called collateral damage. Then to the right of those, uh, those we see this almost indiscernible little white portion of the band which is the 52 people, or 1.6% of those killed, who were positively identified as so-called high-profile or high-value targets. In other words, these were the people who they actually knew who they were, and there was some evidence that they comprised a threat. And then finally, we're left with the, the remainder, the literal kind of gray zone of 2,565 people, or 76.7% of those killed, categorized simply as other. That is, no one has, no one in those who, who make these assessments actually knows who these people were. Obviously, their friends and relations know very well. So this calls into question statements like this one um, in 2012 by uh, President Obama's assistant um, for Homeland Security and Counterterrorism, John Brennan, who said, with the unprecedented ability of remotely piloted aircraft to precisely target a military objective while minimizing collateral damage, one could argue that never before has there been a weapon that allows us to distinguish more effectively between an al-Qaeda ter terrorist and innocent civilians. And the, if the timeline were, continued, were to continue, the problem would, would intensify. Um, the Bureau of Investigative Journalism reports that U.S. counterterror airstrikes have doubled since Trump's inauguration, um, particularly in Somalia, Yemen, and Afghanistan. Um, and at the, in March of 2017, parts of both Somalia and Yemen were given this designation of areas of active hostilities, which effectively suspended even the targeting rules that Obama had brought in to try to prevent civilian ca casualties. And at the same time, the level of secrecy around these targeted assassination programs has increased. And so the fact that these systems of identification are so demonstrably problematic raises questions, I would think, about the advisability of speeding up the process of threat detection through the automation of image analysis. Uh, making a problematic system more efficient doesn't address its fundamental problems. On the contrary, it threats, threatens to amplify them. But nonetheless, within some US military circles, the dream of a technological solution to the problem of too much surveillance continues, uh, invested in more data gathering and analytics. There are a growing number of companies that now offer software for automated recognition of so-called patterns of life. So this image is taken from the website of one of those companies, Aptima, advertising its event, event detection algorithms and, and along with a kind of promotional video. 
So Aptima's event detection builds on claims for the ability to identify anomalous shifts in what comprises a normal scenery of people and persons and activities. So activity here gets defined as either stereotypic or anomalous patterns um, of change over time, which translates then life worlds into phenomena that are conveniently tuned to um, capacities of algorithmic analysis. And we can just begin to imagine what it would be like to walk around trying to figure out how to not engage in any kind of anomalous activity. You know, how to look like a civilian becomes an increasing problem. So automated threat detection then brings us home to San Diego and to what Ivan Char Lopez describes as the cybernetic border. Char Lopez takes the US-Mexico border as a techno-political regime that delineates who belongs within the US homeland and who's taken to be breaching its borderlands as an intruder. So Ivan's historical work um, shows us the extended timeline of this project. So this is a diagram of the envisioned Border Patrol prevention system drawn in 1974. Uh, and Yvonne writes, quote, by framing the borderlands as an abstract problem of inputs, processors, and outputs, INS officials hope to adopt the cool, neutral logic of computers processing information. And yet the continued insistence that the immigra immigration problem was produced by a specific subject, that is Mexicans imagined as deportable aliens, demonstrated the tensions within this abstract formulation. Yvonne explains that the history of air power at the border includes the development in the 1940s of the first drone aircraft, the Fire V, which was designed to serve as a radio controlled target device for anti-artillery weapons training. So the drone at that time was itself actually the target. And while not directed at the border, the first drone, uh, the Fire Bee, was developed by Ryan Aeronautics here in San Diego. In, in San Diego. Um, and it was figured itself as, a, as an intruder um, to be detected and destroyed. As Yvonne reminds us, it was in the 1970s that the so-called McNamara line, developed during the Vietnam War, was reproduced on the US-Mexico border. Sensors were programmed to detect various signs of intrusion into the borderlands, from seismic sensors that measured the stress of footsteps to infrared sensors that detected the presence of body heat. Uh, and throughout the 1990s, Yvonne describes how the Border Patrol implemented a seri series of operations with names like Hold the Line and Gatekeeper to try to preemptively exert control over border crossing. The success of this uh, so-called prevention through deterrence strategy uh, was, was deemed inconclusive by the General Accounting Office, who stated in 1997 that the data available to them did not show a clear picture on whether or not unauthorized border crosses were deterred from pur pursuing illegal entry into the US, or that a decrease in attempted illegal reentries was achieved, nor uh, that border violence had been in any way reduced. Nonetheless, the Department of Homeland Security moved forward with so-called America's Shield in 2005, including the Arizona Border Control Initiative that continued to rely on electronic computing and unmanned aerial surveillance technologies as solutions for, for border crossings. The, the drone system included the Predator B uh, made by General, uh, uh, General Atomics that was deployed from 2005 to 2007. And within these systems, bodies were, the bodies that were detected were classified as either Mexican, other than Mexican, that is Latinx people who came across the southern border of Mexico from Central and South America, or person from a special interest country, that is, in the words of the Office of Border Patrol, Customs and Border Protection, places that, quote, could export individuals that could bring harm to our country in the way of terrorism. So we loop back to reconnect with the wider Homeland Security project of the so-called War on Terror. In the desert areas of the border, Yvonne observes, quote, the brown body targets were coded as adversaries to be captured. Their presence in the borderland was inscribed regardless of their citizen status as inherently suspect. And it's in this way that the border is reconstructed 
from a line to an effective no man's land. So this is like the Berlin Wall or the DMZ between North and South Korea, where you don't, the, the Berlin Wall was actually not a wall, it was two walls with a space between. And so you've created a territory in which any body is a legitimate target. And that's, of course, what's going on um, at, at the US-Mexico borderlands. So anybody in this space is considered an imminent threat to the integrity of the US homeland and thus a legitimate target. And the predator bee's transition from military to customs and border patrol operations progresses further into the homeland with recent proposals for the use of drone systems in the airspace over the city of San Diego. So reporter Katie Siegel has uh, written an article in San Diego Union Tribune describing this, these developments and she writes, quote, Proponents say that the General Atomics MQ-9B, or Predator B, also known as the Sky Guardian, will be used for, quote, mapping of critical infrastructure in the San Diego region. The path and location of the trial flights were not disclosed, and she continues, quote, this is part of a larger initiative on the part of General Atomics to integrate so-called Sky Guardian drones into American skies. A company spokesperson explained that, quote, a test flight in San Diego will feature prominently in demonstrating the drone's civilian capabilities. So we might ask how those civilian capabilities will further expand and intensify a techno-political regime of suspicion, of guilt, until proven innocent, where even that proof of innocence is usually typically after the fact of injury. In the closing chapter of his book, Yvonne turns to artists, activists, artists engaged in projects of resistance. Um, so for example, this mapping of the border revisualized um, as, a, as a killing field by documenting deaths um, in the borderlands by humane borders. And he writes, perhaps presciently visualizing Gloria Anzaldúa's description of La Frontera, the interplay between black and red summons an image of the border as an open wound. And as we know, rather than deterring increasingly desperate migrants, the operations of Customs and Border Patrol forces people into ever more dangerous territory. As Yvonne observes, quote, experimental and operational usage of unmanned aerial systems in the borderlands makes explicit how, in the context of the US empire nation, the foreign and domestic are irremediably intertwined. Along with artists in working in resistance, uh, and I'll, I'll close with this, I take some heart from the crowd pictured here, um, responding to Trump's immigration policies. Um, these are, are Googlers um, in protest. And as you may know, there was a significant uprising among Google workers against the company's participation in Project Maven as well. Um, Google had a contract for Project Maven. There was a sufficient protest, bad press, um, that they discontinued uh, the contract um, last year. And, and they also developed, Google developed a set of ethics principles that included the pledge, quote, not to participate in the development of weapons or other technologies whose principal purpose or, or implementation is to cause or directly facilitate injury to people. And this statement of ethics has been a resource um, for for, for Googlers um, to, to push back on company projects. But with that said, it's clear to me that we need to engage the problem of US militarism and xenophobia at a much deeper level than techno-ethics can address. The circuits that connect DOD and Homeland Security projects are the fantasies of omniscience and the practices of dehumanization that have shaped the politi politics of, of militarism. Uh, since the advent of modern states and war fighting. Rather than further accelerate the speed of war fighting, detention, and deportation, US citizens need to challenge these institutions of enmity and redirect our tax dollars to innovations in diplomacy and social justice that might truly de-escalate the imminent dangers to our collective and planetary security. So I think we have a little time for questions, or shall we go to the panel and? Well, we finished early, so was it five minutes of questions? I mean, five minutes of questions. Group questions too. Exactly. Yeah.
Okay, so any, I guess, more specific questions, um, I would be happy to. <laughs> Yes. Um, do we need a mic for? Could, could you ask them to use the mics? They're on the stand. Hi. Thanks for the talk. Um, how much do you think the conversation about, you know, how accurate or appropriate these technologies are, or how technologically sophisticated they are, detracts from the overall conversation about whether or not? even if you had a perfect technology that was able to detect threats you know, accurately, whether or not that conversation is distracting from the broader sort of political conversation that you know, perhaps maybe should be had, even if you had in an ideal world like the perfect technology. Right. So, so for me, this all starts with the construct of the threat. Um, you know, I don't think we can start with a construct that is in deeply and inherently political, um, racialized, gendered. Um, <laughs> you know, we can't start from there and then imagine that somehow we're going to create a machine that has an, a, per, a perfect ability to detect um, an object <laughs> with those characteristics, right? Because the you know we can't start with constructs that are themselves deeply ambiguous, um, problematic in their application, contestable. You know, our discussions about what constitutes a threat don't come down to, you know, they, they, they do come down to specific entities on occasion, um, but, but they can't be separated from, from the conversations about, about what at any given moment we think constitutes the threat, who is the threat. So, um, for me, it's always a question of what are the what are the the, the entities, the systems of categorization that data analytic technologies are built from, and what's the nature of those categories, and what's the what's what are the effects of trying to stabilize them and fix them in the ways that they need to be, um, or you know even if it's being done mathematically, statistically, probabilistically. Uh, it's still, as I said at the beginning, got, you know, there are humans informing the training data, making sense of the results. So I think these conversations are always um, necessarily political. And um, I do think that claims for accuracy and precision um, distract, uh, but I think that they're, they themselves are so problematic that I'm less worried that, um, you know, even if we could have a perfect system, because I don't even know what perfect would look like from whose point of view, right? Who, who's, who's a threat to whom here? Um, I think we really need to engage. What, what creates enmity? I mean, we look at the so-called war on terror and targeted assassination. Um, you know, this only makes sense if you think there are a fixed number of terrorists in the world and that you can eliminate them. But of course, every person who gets killed has friends, has family. Um, ha you know, we know that the so-called war on terror has actually been generative of enmity towards the United States. So we're, these are dynamic processes. We are there, you know, what we do is performative, has consequences for, for the, the, the generation or the interruption um, of, of the problem that we're, that we're engaging with. Any other hands? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, I guess this is a very complicated topic, and it's it has a lot of information, and it's it has a lot of new information that it's barely coming out, and like not even, uh, I guess not even lawmakers understand at some point. Like how how do you suggest to talk about it with the public and those who are supposed to be aware of this situation um, in a more easy way, or like what is it? What are the key points that I can share with? Uh, people around me um, that I know that they might be um, under a threat or that they can actually help me out to uh, protect those that are in a threat in, this, in a sense. 
<laughs> what do you suggest? That's a big question. I um, yeah, I mean, for me, you know, that part of why I'm so in sort of committed to this this idea of demystification is that I think we need to move away from the idea that these are sort of incredibly powerful, um, omniscient sorts of technical systems to see that actually they're quite provisional. They have very specific requirements. They need lots and lots and lots of data. Um, they're, you know, they're very actually labor intensive. And the question, you know, I guess the question is that we should always look at what are the categories um, that are fed into these systems? Do we think those are, you know, legitimate? Who, the people who are getting sort of put into those categories, what do we think about that? And then, you know, how can we push back on the idea that this is going to make us more secure? Um, or how can we push back on the idea that, um, I mean, we, we know the people who are, I think, subject to these systems are very aware of their fallibility. It's the people who are the promoters of them and who are, have vested interests in them who want to sort of finesse those questions of, of their, their limits and their, their fallibility. Okay, thanks. So you can take a seat up here and then come back when the panel or at the end of the panel. Or actually, Lucy, do you want to move here in the front? So I'd like to welcome Lucy and the panelists um, to sorry, uh, welcome Lucy and the panelists to come sit at the on the stage, and we'll get to hear from three community leaders who have been actually understanding the impacts of these systems as black boxed, as perplexing as they are, as they impact the lives of people in the San Diego Tijuana region. So I'd like to welcome to this. I'd like to welcome to the stage our panelist, Paul Khalid Alexander. He's a professor at City College and a part of the Reclaiming the Community Movement in Southeast San Diego. Also, Tina Givens is an organizer with Rideshare Drivers United, a former Uber driver, and a communication and women's and gender and sexuality studies student at Cal State San Marcos. And Graciela Zamudio Campos is a lawyer specializing in international human rights law and founder of Alma Migrante, a civil association dedicated to strategic litigation based in the city of Tijuana. As well, Graciela designs and implements access to justice strategies for migrant people in the community with other human rights defenders of that region. So um, they will each be giving a brief provocation based on the knowledge that they have of what's going on in this region. And then we'll have a moderated Q&A across the panel and Professor Suchman that I will I'll have. So save up your questions. And thank you so much. So first, um, Paula, uh, Paula Khalid, you want to go? Mm. Shoot, what am I doing? <laughs> You're doing your presentation. <laughs> oh, the full presentation. And how much time did we have? For Eight minutes. Eight minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. I was in my own, own world for a second. <laughs> I think it was the, high, the, the bright lights. And I always try to sit in the middle, as you saw, in order not to be the first person. But <laughs> that's OK. I was outmaneuvered this time. So yeah, my name is uh, Khalid Alexander, um, born and raised in San Diego. Um, uh, the I kind of come from you know uh, a long kind of line of uh, of people in my family who have consistently um, been victims of and fought back against oppression. My great grandfather was a runaway slave. He ended up run away, uh, running away and raising his family on a um, Indian reservation in Omaha, Nebraska. My grandfather, his son. Um, ended up leaving home at a very early age, jumping trains, um, eventually became a labor organizer and a, a communist part party leader um, who was blacklisted from being able to work, started a shoe shop. My mother, um, his daughter, uh, ended up becoming a Black Panther Party member in the Oakland chapter of the Black Panther Party. Um, I became Muslim in 1995, um, and I remember I was in my, that was my senior year of high school, and I remember the principal of the school came to me and he said this was you know towards the end of, of you know this the Soviet Union and he said hey showed me an article I think it was in the Economist or something like that that said that Islam was the new 
enemy of, of the United States. And of course, we began to see kind of parts of that, um, but it didn't come into full fruition until kind of uh, after 9-11. Um, when all of a sudden, I think a lot of Muslims who thought they had assimilated into the United States, um, maybe changed their name to Mo or Sam and other people, who are all of a sudden now realized that they had not quite been embraced uh, by the country they had embraced uh, with the same fervor. Of course, none of this was new to me, coming from a family that has consistently been kind of um, impacted by those types of uh, uh, kind of racist um, and prejudicial behaviors. Uh, I had the opportunity to kind of travel around the world. I returned to the United States um, and began to ask myself kind of what is the role of Islam in the United States? What is my role as an African American um, living in Southeast San Diego? Um, and quickly realized that unless we're kind of putting effort into helping the communities that we're a part of and people that, that, that we live with and, and amongst, that as a Muslim, as a moral obligation, uh, we had kind of an, uh, an obligation to stand up for people um, whether or not we had a direct relationship with them. Um, after moving to Southeast San Diego, this is again after traveling for quite a bit of time, uh, I uh, was pulled over three times by the police um, in two weeks. Um, and what was different, I'd been pulled over by police in the United States before, in San Diego before, um, but what was different about these three times is there was three questions that they asked me each time which I had never been asked before. One, are you a fourth waiver? A fourth waiver is somebody who has spent time in prison and they have to waive their Fourth Amendment rights. And so if you're a fourth waiver, you can be questioned by the police. They can detain you for longer periods of time. There's a number of things they can do to you. You don't have the same right to privacy. Um, two, do you have any tattoos? And three, are you a gang member? At first, I thought that these were all kind of trying to recognize kind of whether or not they were in danger, um, whether or not there was any threat to themselves that they had to be aware of. But what I've realized over the last few years uh, in working with pillars of the community and doing the effort that um, we do in Southeast San Diego is that really these were questions to figure out how many of our rights we could uh, be uh, could be taken away from us. How many of our rights as human beings that can be ignored? So a documented gang member could easily be shot, they could be killed, and all you would see on, and all you do see when this happens in the newspaper is a documented gang member killed by police. Um, this kind of uh, idea and kind of recognize this came to a, a, a pinnacle um, about four years ago when a district attorney, Bonnie Dumanis, rounded up 33 African American men. Um, some of them were living in San Diego, some of them weren't living in San Diego. Uh, the two most known are Aaron Harvey and Brandon Duncan, um, and charged them with 50 years to life. And in court said, we don't think that they committed the crime. They were round up. There was nine shootings that had happened two years before. Out of those nine shootings where guns were shot nine times, one person was actually shot in the leg, non-fatal wound, and the shooter was never caught. Um, but Bonnie Dumanis, the then district attorney, said that we don't think these people committed these crimes. Um, however, under a P obscure penal code called 182.5, we can uh, charge anybody who is allegedly from that gang with any crime that has allegedly been committed by anybody in that gang. Um, Eventually, these two, Aaron Harvey and Brandon Duncan, were a couple of the people who fought back against it. Eventually, a judge threw their case out. Recently, in the last couple of weeks, they actually re um, won a, a lawsuit against the city. But the other, many of the other 33 African American men that were charged with this, many of them took plea deals. One of them uh, is now doing 25 years in prison. His only charge was 182.5, meaning there was no crime physical crime that was associated with him, but under Penal Code 182.5. All of that is kind of crazy and, and worrisome, but kind of connecting that to what we're talking about with surveillance, um, how somebody is documented as a gang member is extremely problematic. Um, so there's nine criteria within California. Different cities have a little bit of differences. Um, if you, so for example, if you're seen by law enforcement talking to a documented gang member, that can count as one criteria. You only need to hit two to three criteria in order to be documented as a gang member. So talking to a gang member, whether that's your brother, whether that's your neighbor, whether it's a kid you're going to school with on the bus, can count as uh, one thing. Wearing a gang color can be considered doing it. So if you're wearing blue, green, essentially any color in a gang neighborhood, then you can be documented by a gang member. Um, when we began to find out about these streetlights, the first concern became, 
oh, now not only do they have to have a law enforcement officer who's physically there watching it, but they can now use these street lights in order to document really anybody at any time under a street light. The reason why that's the most problematic, well, there's a number of things that are problematic with all of that. But if you're able to then do that, the way that the district attorney uses gang documentation and gang enhancements is in court. So you charge them for 50 years to life. You say we're going to be charging you with these gang documentation. So why don't you just take 25? You don't have a lawyer. You don't have a community that's there to support you. You don't have anything else. It's very difficult to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to fight against this. I'm going to risk spending the rest of my life in prison and therefore sign it. And so with the advent of finding out about these street lights, um, that uh, I guess I didn't talk much about the street lights, uh, that uh, there are now the smart city, San Diego is a smart city that has close to 4,000 street lights that have already been um, put up uh, around San Diego. I believe there's 4,000 more that they had the intention to do, that uh, not only do they record um, video, but they also have uh, audio capabilities as well as metadata tracking and other things. And so uh, the first thing that got us interested in technology, because I'm a technophobe, um, a, a proud kind of borderline Luddite, um, was the implications of law enforcement using these technologies and streetlights to document people as gang members and then use that to get them to take plea deals in court. Um, and I think that's about my eight minutes. So, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Don't encourage me because I'll keep talking. <laughs> yeah. Okay, sure. Yeah. Awesome. Hi, everybody. I am Tina Givens. I am uh, the the co-founder of Rideshare Drivers United San Diego. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization, hopefully soon to become an actual recognized union, that organizes uh, rideshare drivers uh, in San Diego. That's what our chapter is doing currently. We have about 13,000 members in the state of California alone. Um, I don't know, there might be some of you that saw the Uber strikes in May last year um, that went around the world. We had about 14 different countries participate with us and uh, we stood up on the eve of Uber's IPO to protest um, the misclassification of workers and uh, just egregious uh, incidents against drivers and particularly um, uh, garnishment and wages and things like that. Um, I'm kind of coming at this from a little bit of a different perspective. Um, gosh, I don't even, I'm like, I don't want to follow anybody. This is all interesting. I just want to sit here and listen to everyone. It's been fantastic so far and thank you everybody and thanks Lily for inviting me. Um, <clears throat> What got me interested is if you look at the breakdown of the number of gig workers in the United States is about one in four people. Um, of those, a lot of those are rideshare drivers. In San Diego County, we're estimating that most of the population of rideshare um, drivers are actually from different communities, particularly Sub-Saharan African, Ethiopian, um, and non-resident drivers that are coming in from across the border. Um, I have been working with Rideshare Drivers uh, United for over the last year and a half. In that time, I've spoken to over a thousand drivers um, about their experiences driving Rideshare. Um, I know coming from my own um, background, um, I started organizing with ACLU very early on and did nonprofit work for a long time and actually uh, drove Uber. <clears throat> in order to offset the medical costs of taking care of a terminally ill parent while trying to go to school and trying to do everything else. Um, so much of that is relatable to so many people that work within the gig economy, right? It's just gonna be that one thing that puts us over the edge to at least get us to a living wage, right? And what ended up happening over years of driving is I watched my wages steadily decrease, and this is something that unfortunately is not an anomaly we hear a lot about. Um, I got introduced to Rights for Drivers United through a professor at my um, campus in, at Cal State San Marcos, and he brought me in just based on my Uber driving experience and my organizing experience, and since then it's um, been kind of an incredible ride. Through talking to at least a thousand of these drivers, um, I've heard stories that continue to make me sort of work harder every day. Uh, we have drivers uh, specifically that uh, are living in their cars. They are in debt traps and leasing cars from these companies that um, they're not understanding completely what they're getting roped into. There's certain criteria that continues to change. They're paying between $250 to $400 a week to lease the cars. They're driving 14 to 16 hours a day in order to continue to pay for those cars and can't keep up with the cost of living in San Diego, right? And it just becomes like indentured service. Um, I have uh, talked to drivers who have had 
many uh, issues with unsafe experiences. I don't know how many of you saw the data um, released from Uber this year that there was over 6,000 sexual assault claims that were reported, which means there are probably more, uh, reported through Uber and Lyft for the last two uh, years. Um, and so driving rideshare in particular is one of the most dangerous jobs that you can do. Um, what's happening that we're noticing right now in San Diego County in particular around surveillance and data is um, we know that these apps are tracking us at all times. They are collecting information about where we're going, where we pick up, where we drop off riders, um, when we're on the app, when we're canceling rides. Uh, we do have one member, because this is an international problem, we do have one member who actually went to court in the UK to request his um, data points and his data profile from Uber because what you see in the app is a very limited, in the driver app, is a very limited snapshot of what they're actually collecting on you. Uh, when he went to court and got the information, it was over a 30-page document that was just uh, just points and points, just information galore about what he was doing. Uh, he took them to court partly to um, request that he, you know, actually be classified as a worker and to hopefully recoup some of his diminished wages. And they said, well, we have this one point here that you were documented. You were in your car at such and such location. You were off the app canceling rides but playing Candy Crush on your phone. And so, therefore, your wages are, your admission wages are your own fault. Um, the point of all this is there is a digital curtain that exists. There's an algorithmic boss that we don't know anything about, and there's a digital curtain that exists that we can't see behind, right? And so uh, these particular rideshare companies are extremely protective of their data. And to get access to these things, um, we're basically, it is like a David and Goliath fight. That's one of the things that Rideshare Drivers United is working on in particular. Um, we are hearing from our undocumented community, our non-resident community who are in Tecate, who are driving over the border on a daily basis, which they're able to do. Um, with an IPN number, they can come, they can cross the border and come into the United States and drive. Um, they are reporting that they are suspecting that they are, um, their information, their data has been shared with government agencies via Uber and Lyft, and they are being pulled over, detained, and um, sometimes arrested through different border checkpoints. Um, we would love to verify that claim. I might talk to you later um, because we have no way of knowing if their information has been shared, except it's all right now based on the backs of the drivers who are sharing these stories with us saying, this is what's happening, this is what's going on, and this is what we believe is going down. Um, so part of this too is working for uh, an algorithmic boss um, who gives you no information about, um, about work and what's expected of you is the opportunity at any time to be kicked off the app. And that might not sound like that big of a deal, but when you are solely dependent on this, uh, this job to you know, meet your living wage, um, it becomes impossible to appeal these things. It's a completely, it's like a non sequitur. They make these decisions with, uh, on a snap, on a whim. Uh, drivers are not notified at all. There's no warning and there's no appeals process. They have a very small investigation team. Uh, if there is a complaint made by a passenger, um, there's no way for the drivers to follow up and find out what happened. They just know all they're notified is you've been kicked off the app and they're given no information about when they're gonna let, be let back on. So people who are sleeping in their cars, this is a very big deal, right? Um, we also know that there are um, major safety issues internationally. Uh, I just was lucky enough to attend a, an Ox a conference in Oxford. Oxford. It was the first convening of app-based, excuse me, app-based transport workers. While we were there, there was a driver in South Africa that was stabbed, put in his trunk, and set on fire. Right. So we know that um, Uber has been aware of these safety issues for years. Right? So the sexual assault data that was released last, this year proves that. While they're, why they're not sharing that data, why they're not responding to that data, why they're not um, letting the drivers know, hey, these might be areas you might not want to go into, these might be hours that might provide, you know, might put you in positions of, you know, being less safe, whatever it is, why they're not sharing that data is one of the things that we're going to be focusing on this year because, as I said, they are very protective of this. They too claim that it's, um, you know, it's important for their business model that they not share this information because God forbid it gets shared, you know, with people that can maybe take it up and create competition. Um, but uh, it is one of the things that we're working towards. And um, if anybody's interested in more information, I'd be more than happy to share with you because I am sure that there are drivers in this room and um, 
I know that we have strength in numbers, and I know that it's our responsibility to change this economy. So thanks. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Um, y muchas gracias por la invitación a esta maravillosa conferencia también. Thank you so much for this invitation to this wonderful conference today. Um, gracias, Sara, por interpretarme esta noche. Thank you, me, the, I'm the interpreter. <laughs> Thank you to me. <laughs> y bueno, de pues, nada. yo les voy a hablar un poco de las experiencias de una abogada en la frontera. So, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, the experiences of a lawyer that works at the border. Eh, entre México y Estados Unidos, between, específicamente en Tijuana. Between Mexico and the U.S., specifically in Tijuana. Donde estoy maravillada todo el tiempo porque suceden cosas que no suceden en ningún otro lugar. Where I'm, I am just amazed uh, uh, with the things that happened every day uh, at the border. Y bueno, siempre tenemos que identificar eh, lo que dice la ley y lo que pasa en la calle. We always have to identify what uh, the, lay, the law says and what really happens in the streets. Entonces, en el caso de el movimiento transfronterizo que existe en la frontera, in the case of the movement that happens eh, in and out of the, of the border, eh, he puesto mucho mi atención en los procedimientos de extradición que se hacen omitiendo la aplicación de la ley de extradición y sus tratados binacionales. Um, I have put a lot of attention in the procedures that happened uh, that happen regarding the lay of extra, uh, the law of extradition, uh, particularly in uh, movements that happen between the borders. Mm -hmm. Sin tener en consideración la aplicación de esta normatividad. Without taking into consideration the application of this uh, application. Um, en este sentido, tenemos una importante colaboración entre las policías eh, de San Diego y Tijuana. In this sense, we have a big uh, collabor uh, collaboration with the police department, both in Tijuana and in San Diego. Eh, de la cual, de hecho, se aprecian bastante. In, as a matter of fact, they do, are very similar in the, both of them. Y, y están muy contentos de hacerlo. And they're very happy to do so. Um, la ley de extradición y el tratado bilateral relacionado con la extradición que tienen los dos países... The, lay of, uh, the law of extradition and the uh, bilateral treaty uh, in regarding the extradition of the law tiene como estrategia básica, como proceso básico, eh, el involucramiento de diferentes autoridades. It has as a basic strategy the in having both uh, parties being in, uh, involved. En el proceso de extradición se involucran varias autoridades mexicanas como son el secretario de, de eh, Relaciones Exteriores por una parte, por otra parte la Judicatura Federal y por otra parte la Fiscalía Federal de la República. So this process of extradition has three uh, compartments. One of them is the Secretary uh, of ex, uh, <coughs> Ministry of uh, uh, Exterior Relations, um, the prosecution and Sorry, what was the, ¿Cuál era la última? Y la, los jueces federales. And the federal judges. Um, los jueces federales deben revisar las órdenes de aprehensión que eh, Estados Unidos envía para poder aprender a una persona en el territorio donde no tiene jurisdicción. The federal judges need to be able to uh, supervise and go over the apprehension, the people that are apprehended, in order to monitor who goes in and out. Y es específicamente la Procuraduría Federal quien entrega físicamente a la persona, a las autoridades, una vez que todo el procedimiento ha sido terminado. And it is specifically the Federal uh, Prosecution Office that needs to um, uh, oversee the whole process. Mm -hmm. eh, entregando a la persona directamente a las autoridades de Estados Unidos. Uh, submitting uh, the person directly to the United States. Um, eso es lo que dice la ley, la ley y el tratado. That is what the law says and the treaty says. Sin embargo, en la realidad lo que sucede, however, in reality what actually happens, es que las policías de San Diego y Tijuana intercambian información y obtienen así los policías de Tijuana información sobre 
eh, las órdenes de aprehensión que las personas en Tijuana tienen en Estados Unidos. So what happens is that the two police is able, the police in uh, Tijuana and the police in San Diego share information um, in order to um, uh, directly uh, apprehend people in Tijuana. Y después de obtener esta información, eh, detienen a la persona y la llevan al Instituto Nacional de Migración para su deportación a Estados Unidos. Sorry. What happens is that after detaining this person, uh, they take the person to the uh, immigration court in the U.S. in order to pr uh, prosecute them here. Y todo esto pasa por la utilización de un sistema tecnológico donde se encuentra toda esa información y se traspasa a autoridades mexicanas. Uh, the reason why this happens is because the information is located in an informational system that is then shared uh, and communicated between the two countries and um, not following the, the procedure. Um, <coughs> y bueno, pues esta es una de las cosas que suceden en la frontera cuando eh, hay un hermanamiento tan fuerte entre las dos policías transfronterizas. And this is just one of the things that happens when there is such a um, close sisterhood between the two uh, police departments or police uh, authorities of both countries. Ignorando así tanto la ley como el tratado binacional que regula esta situación. Um, at the same time ignoring the treaty and the uh, bylaw between the two countries. Lo importante en esta situación es que ha habido resoluciones que lo visibilizan. Está una recomendación de la Comisión Nacional de los Derechos Humanos, que es la 68 del 2017, que documenta un caso precisamente así. Um, this is not something completely impossible to resolve. There has been multiple recommendations. For example, the recommendation uh, according to the... Um, uh, National Commission of the Human Rights uh, mm, did a recommendation called the 68 to in was released or put in effect in 2017 that actually explains a specific case. Es el caso de una persona que eh, tiene la doble nacionalidad. It is the case of a person that has a double nationality. Y entonces es detenida con motivo de una um, orden de aprehensión que tiene en Estados Unidos. And she was detained with uh, an order because of um, being apprehended uh, in the U in Mexico. Eh, pero la detención ocurrió en Tijuana. But the detention happened in, in Tijuana. El momento en el que la persona tiene contacto con el Instituto Nacional de Migración. In the moment when the uh, person has the first initial contact with the uh, Institute of Ministry of Immigration. Um, el Instituto Nacional de Migración establece que se trata de una persona extranjera. Um, the, actually, it's the Homeland Security um, is in Mexico. In Mexico, correct. Uh, Instituto Nacional de Migración, sorry. Um, establece que se trata de una persona extranjera. Um, the Homeland Security establishes that it, we are in fact talking about a, uh, an, an alien. In Mexico. In Mexico. Um, a pesar de que la persona se autoidentificó como persona mexicana. Even though the person identified herself or himself as a um, uh, Mexican person. Um, la persona fue deportada sin haber tenido un acreditamiento de su nacionalidad. The person was then deported without having a proper accreditation of her nationality. Y esto lo supimos porque su familia tenía consigo todas las identificaciones que la identificaban como eh, extranjera. And this was possible to identify because her family members had um, all the documents that proved uh, that she was a uh, national from Mexico. From, uh, from the U.S., excuse me. Um, y esto es algo sumamente importante porque no importa la, no la nacionalidad que una persona tenga, siempre debe de seguirse el proceso legal que establece la ley de extradición y el tratado internacional. And this is something very important to notice because there's always need to be, we all, it's important to follow what the uh, law says in these procedures. 
Y la realidad de las cosas es que la, la tecnología puede utilizarse eh, precisamente para cumplir con la ley. And the reality is that the technology can actually really help us in order to follow the law. Y esa sería mi propuesta en el sentido de que este tipo de sistemas permitieran que el, un Estado eh, comparta la información con las autoridades competentes. And this is my proposal where I uh, believe that the technologies could help uh, c the communication between um, the, two, um, the two parts and, um, Las autoridades que sean and both authorities had to be competent. According to the law. <laughs> According to the law. Thank you. Um, estas son esas cosas que suceden, que son ilegales y que nadie sabe a pesar de que esta es la región en la que vivimos. These are the illegal things that happen and that we are unaware of them even though we live here. Y por esa razón me pareció muy importante compartirlas con ustedes. And eh, that's why I feel like it's very, uh, I wanted to uh, share these with you. Para evitar que compartir la información tenga la finalidad de no cumplir con la ley. In order to um, sharing the information uh, have the end result of not following the law. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you so much for all that amazing um, history and insights about what's going on. So what we're going to do is I have a couple of questions just to get things started. Also, we welcome questions and comments from the people in the audience. We're going to have two people um, running microphones around because we know if you're in the middle, you're not going to want to like crawl over everybody just to ask a question. So um, I think our volunteer coordinator is going to get the mic runners, but we can look for forward to that. Simeon, we'll have mic runners, right? Awesome. Okay. So yeah, if you want to, if you want to ask a question, just raise your hand. Um, the questions I wanted to start off with, um, well, I kind of can't, I, don't, I kind of can't choose which one. So it seems like one of the themes is that there's data collected and interpreted. Where does the data get interpreted? In what institutional place? Is it the police that are interpreting it? Are the judges interpreting it? Are the workers themselves or the citizens interpreting it? Um, so I think Lucy really usefully reframed the problem of AI as this problem of kind of data collection and interpretation to re oversimplify what you said earlier in your talk. So can these problems of interpretation and collection be addressed by coming up with better algorithms? Because that's a big move right now in the AI and ethics space. Or what, are, what could we imagine would be the limitations of that? Um, I, I <coughs> thought I would respond to that, but by way of asking a question back to Graciela. Yes, please <laughs> speak to each other also. These are yeah. just to kick things um, off. Because I'm really struck that, that there's, on the one hand, there's information sharing going on between police departments. Oh. And on the other hand, there's the lack of a data, data infrastructure or that would provide access to documentation that's relevant mm -hmm. to carrying out the law. Um, and, and so I think that's interesting and it suggests that where information systems are developed, where the investment mm -hmm. is made to develop them, what practices there are around them is um, you know, a very important political and economic question, right? And um, the resources and the information sharing happen in some ways and not others, and that's you know there are things we could, we could um, we could come to understand more about why that happens. Um, una autoridad diría que por practicidad y eficiencia. Uh, one authority would say that it would be for pract uh, for practical and for efficiency um, methods porque están tan cerca y colaboran tan, tan juntos. Because they're so close together and they collaborate uh, together. Um, probablemente un, una defensora de derechos humanos como yo. Probably a woman that defends the human rights like I am. Um, pensaría más bien que es un tema de utilizar la tecnología para poder cumplir con la ley. 
it is actually a matter of using the technology to follow the law. Y también el hecho de que no suceda como debe suceder. And also the fact that it doesn't happen like it should. Tiene su razón en que existe un clima en donde la soberanía de la ley mexicana es pisada por las autoridades de Estados Unidos. Um, it exists in this climate where the um, Mexican authority, sovereignty, sovereignty um, has um, it is it exists in a climate uh, that is uh, squished or stepped on by the um, American um, authorities. Eso de una forma y de otra forma también por el otro lado. And that's in one aspect, but also in the other aspect, in another way. Um, las autoridades mexicanas eh, justifican su actuar con las autoridades estadounidenses y estas creen que todo es legal. Also, the uh, Mexican authorities um, work and with the uh, American authorities and they think that the, the Mexican authorities think that this is okay. No, the U.S. authorities. Oh, the U.S. authorities think that, th that that's totally okay. Entonces, también hay un poco como de unawareness. So that's why there's a little bit of an unawareness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do any of the other panelists have thoughts on the question of you know, whether you can have a technical approach to addressing these problems that you're describing? Because like what I heard from these talks is there's these deep histories of categorizing people as threats, intruders. <laughs> um, and so I just thought I would invite you if you want to comment <coughs> on it. But or yeah, so the, the answer is like, I mean, I think the question is, can we come up with technologies that can somehow identify threats in a, and, and, and or can be more fair? That can be can code a, can code the bias away. Sometimes with like, pr sometimes algorithms are posed as, oh, there's these racist judges, but by having an algorithm that measures, you know, someone's actual propensity to break bail, like we can assign bail. Um, so the algorithms are said to be more objective. Right. Yeah. No, that? I don't think so. Uh, the, the par part of the reason why I kind of preface the talk with kind of my family background is because all of, you know, whether you're a runaway slave, whether you were a slave that refused to obey, whether uh, you were uh, involved in the Communist Party, whether you were a part of the Black Panthers, all of those were threats, right? Mm -hmm. And, and the, the, uh, whether you're a gang member, mm -hmm. um, the, all of those are the actual threats that they've been defined as the threat. So I think the problem mm -hmm. is the definition of people as, uh, as threats. And so I only see kind of the use of these technologies by law enforcement mm -hmm. as being able to ramp up that threat. Because the problem is at the root of all of this, at the root of how we see the world, at the root of how we see one another, are these very problematic assumptions. Um, and as long as we have people who are defining kind of um, the other, as long as we have people who are defining kind of uh, who's a criminal, who's not a criminal, I think it would be, uh, I, I think the biggest problem with technology is it's human beings that are behind it. <laughs> um, and we like to think of technology as this kind of omnipotent thing, as you were talking about. Neil Postman in his book Technopoly talks about how we're turning into a society that um, that uh, really technology has taken the place of religion, technology has taken the place of, of, um, of, of, of all type of hierarchies and we now submit ourselves to technologies and I think what's kind of really important about the work that you're doing is kind of demystifying technology and so on the one hand, mm -hmm. you know, I came here hoping I'd be more comfortable with technology and I'm just more scared. <laughs> um, Sorry. But, <laughs> but at the same time, the fact that these conversations are happening, I think, challenges this idea that we're already living in a world where it is. So I, I'm a little bit hopeful. But to answer the question, no, I don't think there's any way to make technologies help us with our biases. So unless somebody else wants to chime in on that, um, I see that there's a question uh, or are there are there questions and comments from the audience right now? Or okay, well I have another nope. question. There's, there's oh, good, oh. fabulous. <laughs> um, this is a question for Graciela. Um, how, well, I, okay, so I know I'm just gonna do it in English, and you can translate because mm -hmm. I know Spanish a bit too, but it's okay. Um, <laughs> so my question actually is for you, Graciela, because I know that you've been asking, or well, not asking, but you've been saying that. Um, 
we can use technology to make to make uh, authorities follow the law, or or to because that, that's the that's the case. Like how, how you mentioned that authorities are not even complying to the law; they're just doing whatever they think that's it's quote unquote best for for protecting quote unquote <laughs> the uh, the public. But um, has any idea come out uh, with? you maybe talking to other colleagues or anything as in like how do, how does that look like for technology to help to follow the law Qué buena pregunta muchas gracias por esa pregunta That's a really good question thank you so much eh, yo creo que coincido con mi compañero de, de panel eh, cuando dice que lo importante son los seres humanos detrás de la tecnología um, I am totally agree with my colleague of the panel that um, the humans behind the technology are the ones in charge. Mm -hmm. Porque si se eligen a las autoridades competentes de acuerdo con la ley. Because if you, they elect the um, uh, correct authorities um, according to the law. Para poder utilizar estos canales de um, compartir información. In order to be able to use these channels of uh, sharing information. Entonces, ¿se puede, ¿se puede lograr eficiencia? Uh, you can achieve efficiency. ¿Se puede lograr practicidad? Uh, you can achieve uh, practicality. Y se puede lograr legalidad. And you can also achieve uh, legality. El tema es que para llegar ahí, the, uh, the, the thing is, that in order to get there, necesitamos regular yeah. esa forma de... Um, Operación. We have to regulate that way of, operati of operating. Y para regular, para cambiar la ley, necesitamos tener una voluntad internacional y política mm -hmm. en la mesa. And in order to achieve that, we need to have a, um, a international um, inf uh, sharing of information will. and will. Mm -hmm. eh, y creo que por lo que he estado aprendiendo hoy, la tecnología y la voluntad política están íntimamente ligadas. And from what I've learned today, um, the uh, will and the uh, political, the political will and the personal will are both interconnected. Mm. Technology. Mm. Oh, and the technology, yeah. sorry. Sí, respondí tu pregunta. Did I answer your question? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I'm hearing in the panel is that um, there's two, a lot of times people talk about technology as a black box. The black box, you don't know what's going on inside, but it is having effects. And you know, this is actually a computer science term as well. Um, but the black box also seems like the legal institutional system. So like what tools have you all found for trying to understand these black boxes of these socio-technical and bureaucratic systems that are generating harm for communities? And what, and what tools do we need that we don't have right now? Well, um, I would say, I would point people to your work, Lily, if they ask me that question. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> because I think, I mean, you've done, you've done an enormous. That was not the point of the question. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. But so I think about, well, who do I think is doing this work? and. Uh, this work of kind of um, helping us understand, demystifying, helping us understand how these systems actually operate. So I think of your work in relation to Amazon Turk and mm. also your intervention of kind of turning the recommender system upside down so that workers get to review their employers mm. and, you know, um, trying to take these tools and actually re-direct <coughs> re, um, them. It put them into into other hands, so I think that's incredibly important. Um, and also, I I really um, I'm a great fan of the work of the AI Now Institute in New York. That's where Kate Crawford is, Meredith Whitaker. Um, this Anatomy of an AI System project I think is just amazing because it shows everything from resource extraction, distributions of labor, distributions of reward. Um, disposal, it, it, the, the, it really broadens the frame of, of 
away from thinking of you know Alexa or the Amazon Echo as this sort of smart device that sits on our kitchen table and just kind of magically answers our questions or turns on our lights to actually show that network devices like this have enormous natural resource requirements, labor requirements, implications for planetary sustainability and so forth. So I think that kind of frame broadening is, is really important and, and I think the AI Now Institute is doing that really well. They're also really connected with networks in New York, including the taxi drivers and so they're similar to this event. They're, they're really trying to get these conversations going. There's also a very nice um, essay by uh, Kate Crawford and Trevor Paglin called Excavating AI, mm. which is about machine learning. Um, really beautifully written, really helpful in understanding how machine learning works and uh, the kinds of, of classification systems, um, the kinds of, you know, sort of actually understanding. Uh, there's also um, uh, uh, Jenna Burrell at UC Berkeley um, has a lovely paper called How the Machine Thinks, which again gives you, you know, even for people like myself who are not mathematically or statistically sophisticated, you begin to get a sense of the difference between the kind of pattern, the, the kind of, of statistical correlations um, that are actually running uh, through these systems and what comes out in the form of results gets translated back into terms that can be mapped back onto our worlds and our activities. And those mappings are really crucial and they don't really get talked about very much. You know, it's, so so th there are people, I think, doing this work. Mm -hmm. Like you. <laughs> if I could answer that too, um, mm -hmm. this is when my, my women's studies comes out, but it always reminds me of um, that Andrea Dworkin quote around sexual assault that, mm -hmm. um, you know what I'm talking about, when, um, when uh, someone steps forward to uh, accuse someone of sexual assault, the thing you want to avoid is being the first person, because the first person's always never believed, right? Uh, the victim's always blamed and then they're never believed. And I tend to find the same thing with people who are coming forward with these data rights issues. Um, they're screaming into the dark a lot mm -hmm. of times. So one of the things that we're doing to counter that is amplifying the stories. That to us is one of the biggest things that we can do is we're creating our own database of stories from drivers all mm -hmm. the time who, and we're coding that information through their stories and collecting <coughs> that. So together uh, we're building uh, a union and strength in numbers that's going to lead to collective bargaining. It's going to allow that flip where we're going to be able to take it back to the um, uh, employer, which is what they are, uh, and talk to them about our stories and tell them, you know, this is these are the things that are proven, these are the things that we have seen, these are the things that we have experienced. And through unionization and regulation, mm -hmm. that is such an important part. Um, that regulation and policymakers, and I <coughs> talked about this earlier in Lily's class, like um, this institutional legitimacy that these companies are hiring uh, these academics out of these um, these certain institutions and bringing them on, and they're writing and creating research that is sponsored by some of these you know big companies, and they're giving it over to legislators, saying, "Well, see yeah. here, because I'm from MIT and I wrote this paper." You know, my, my research is valid, even though it's being completely funded by the companies, right, that um, are trying to fight a lot of the legislation or um, influence legislation. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we have found is strength in numbers because it becomes um, almost like a David and Goliath kind of fight, where right now, um, for example, like Uber, Lyft, and DoorDash have pulled $110 million to put uh, an initiative on the November ballot to repeal AB5, which is a bill that restores employees rights and wages and labor protections to rideshare drivers. Mm -hmm. They don't want to classify it. They don't want it to recognize rideshare drivers as, as employees. And so they're fighting us tooth and nail about that. So by amplifying voices and coming together and collectively organizing, um, that's been the thing so far that has pushed them back mm -hmm. and has put them to the wall and mm -hmm. has made us together, all of our stories together, become valid um, and become amplified. And I think that is one of the biggest tricks. The, so I, I agree with what everybody has said so far. I think people like yourself, but also the students here who, again, because the only reason why I didn't talk much about the streetlights and all of the things in the process of coming about, but the only reason why I n knew that they were scary is I went to one kind of San Diego City info session 
and they went over it and I was thinking to myself, I was like, yo, this sounds scary. And then I was able to meet you and I talked to you and you were like, yo, <laughs> it's scary, <laughs> it's scary <laughs> right? And so that was able to validate what I was already worried about. But having more people, more students who look at technology, not just as kind of this kind of blessing that's happened to society, but look at it with a critical eye. But the other thing that I think is really important is a lot of the conversations so far that I have and that we have even, even as the Trust Coalition is mm -hmm. how can we use the systems that are already established mm -hmm. in order to re uh, regulate these types mm -hmm. of things. I really need to th think that we need to have more people who understand these things who begin to think of ways to resist these techn technologies. Mm -hmm. um, and so you have millions of dollars that are going into uh, these technologies that are really creating kind of new kings and new people who are in power and you know multi-millionaires who aren't going to just give that power up. Right. Mm -hmm. And unless we have people that are really studying and understand these technologies and figuring out ways to fight back against them, you know, with technologies and be able to challenge them, um, and, and more of a, and not through the typical kind of systems that we already have in place, mm -hmm. but like guerrilla type resistance, I think we're gonna be real in, in a lot of uh, a trouble because these people aren't going anywhere. The technologies are not going to stop surveilling us. Um, and again, it's, it's a really scary situation. So unless we have more people mm -hmm. who are understanding these issues and looking at them in a broad way, one of the things that is, is, is scariest for me is those, those people who are most impacted in Somalia, in Yemen, in Southeast San Diego, in these places are the people who understand the technologies the least. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so unless we begin to have those people who do under, people who are in a privileged position to be able to study and understand these things that are really going into communities and figuring out ways to, um, to explain and demystify uh, mm -hmm. what, what these concerns are and get those people on the ground and fighting back, I think we're in a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. Me gustaría agregar una cosa nada más al respecto. I would like to add one more thing uh, regarding this subject. Um, si necesitamos ampli amplificar nuestras historias, we do need to amplify our stories a través de la tecnología, through the technology. Pero es mucho más importante creer en el poder de esas historias. But it's so much more important to believe in the power of those uh, of those stories. Mm -hmm. Porque cuando contamos esas historias, because when we tell those stories, en amplificación, in an amplified manner, lo que ponemos a través de la tecnología allá afuera, what we put out uh, through the technology out there, es nuestra identidad, is, uh, is our identity, y nuestra autorrepresentación, and our <coughs> own uh, autorepresentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want just to respond to this. Um, you know, you, Khaled, you were saying that when you, you, you talked to me, it was sort of like I'm ratifying what you feel and offering some kind of technical knowledge. But actually, I had heard of Pillars of the Community because of the work that you all had done to fight the Cal Gangs database that you were telling us about. Mm -hmm. And the Cal Gangs database is a kind of like hungry monster of data that creates guilt by association, which is really similar to, mm -hmm. it seems like, what happened. Absolutely. Well, these like in drone strikes in the Middle East, they don't need to know who they're killing, they just need to know there's a pattern of life that's suspicious, as you were talking about. And so I think, and that also points to the role of journalists, some of whom are in the room, um, to allow for the circulation of these stories so that we know how to listen to each other more across, rather than just staying in our kind of communities. Um, so yeah, thank you for that work that Pillars has done, because I learned a lot from it. Yeah. Um, we do, we have a question mm -hmm. in the audience. I, I, um, I want to, I don't know that I'm really playing devil advocate, but uh, I am a primatologist and a behavioral ecologist. And whenever I listen to uh, talks about uh, technology and stuff like that, I always come up, this sense, have a sense, wow, this is so natural what's going on. So Lucy, when you were, were talking about uh, that we're trying to evaluate threat and what the question of threat, perceptual systems in animals evolve to, to address threat. So when I study baboons in Africa, and they have a characteristic alarm call that they make towards snakes, mm -hmm. they sometimes make it towards tortoises, or towards shoes, or towards something that they don't recognize, right? So in that sense, a lot of what we're doing is, is, not, is not unusual, right? So that's one comment that, that I think we should, we should kind of at least consider. Um, 
The second thing is that uh, I, I work in several projects where I'm working with machine learners and domain experts, let's say facial expressions to detect pain in horses. Or we're working now on a project to look at drone footage of baboons moving in Africa to be able to say something more about troop movement. Um, and now I'm thinking, oh my god, we're surveilling the baboons and what are we doing? And we're defining uh, right patterns of activity and stuff like that. But what I wanted to get back at as the quality of the machine learning to address a particular issue, a domain expertise, uh, I'm constantly trying to tell the domain experts that they need to own the data, not the technologist and not the machine learners. So engineers who want machine learning want to develop algorithm based on categories that are given to them. Give me a lot of video that says pay no pain. Mm -hmm. And the domain experts are saying, oh, I'm just going to film what I usually do and I'm going to hand it over to them to machine learners and they'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. So the sense that I'm teaching domain experts to own their data and they have to own the quality because the machine learning is only going to be as good as what the people who know the domain are going to say, I want to maybe say the same thing to, to us, right? So we need to have access to the street lights and we need to, to have access to that. Mm, so topic. the complexity of the technology, how different is it from the complexity of the tax laws, of other laws, right? And what do we have when we have complexities of, 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 of uh, language like that is that we have a lawyer who is an advocate for uh, people who don't understand the law. And is there a role now for you and for the journalists to be the advocates for the people who don't understand the technology? The last point I want to make is I want to tie it back to something that Bruno Latour says when he writes about how to do good actor network theory. And he talks about what it means to write risky accounts. And to him, to write an account of, of something is to actually give it to the subjects who he's writing about, and to let them resist the interpretation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's a little bit of what, what needs to happen now with, with uh, the technology. So there are like four really interesting questions and provocations, and I welcome to you to take up whichever ones. Uh, <laughs> yes, well, well as, a, as an anthropologist, I want to take up your first point. <laughs> because I think that, of course, we are animals. Um, and we can, to some degree, understand our ways of being in the world um, in, in a kind of ethological mode. But we are also creatures, uh, the, the, la the layers of cultural complexity that have been put, you know, that have been layered onto our, <laughs> our animal orientations over the, the years that, that we've been around. Um, really uh, transform those. Uh, so, so we can say, yes, we are sort of hardwired to be oriented to threat, but that doesn't take us very far in understanding at any particular historical cultural moment how that threat is being culturally figured for us, constituted for us, because we learn what what is a threat. and. And for, for many of us, um, we're, I think the people who are most vulnerable to the, you know, the kind of uh, regimes of insecurity that we live with now in terms of othering and dehumanizing are the people who are actually the most safe, the most privileged, um, you know, who are not confronting threats on a day-to-day -day basis, mm -hmm. but have a kind of an, an, an imagined other um, of whom we are being instructed constantly to be very afraid. And that other is figured as a gang member, as a communist, as a Muslim. I mean, you know, the, so, so I, I think that we've gone- Basically, it's me. <laughs> a little more. You are the personification. <laughs> um, absolutely, your family credentials. Your <laughs> so you know, but but we are we have moved so far from uh, you know from and of course in our lives we are still you know subject to encountering those moments of instinctual um, response. But we've moved so far away from those that we've got to engage with the learning. Um, the, the ways we're being taught 
on a constant basis what we should feel in terms of security and security fear, fear and so forth. So, um, yeah. So I, I, I think there's there's um, there, there's only so much that we can understand of what's going on at the present moment, um, sort of eth ethologically, I guess. Um, so that's one of your questions. Um. <laughs> Well, the, I mean, the only thing that, that I would add to that is uh, as kind of like a self-professed baboon that like will hiss at turtles and like anything that, that walks by, <laughs> I, feel, I feel like, and I think this is what you're saying, we don't have enough baboons. Um, and there's not enough people, if you look at, you know, just Facebook and um, I don't even think young people do Facebook anymore, I don't know, but like Instagram, all these, out, there's not enough people that are all worried about completely giving away all of their information mm -hmm. at any point. And one of the things that we've come up on in the beginning when we were talking about these lights is, ah, so what? They're there to cr kill criminals. Because the counter narrative is, uh, not kill criminals, catch criminals. The counter narrative mm -hmm. is that, no, these are actually good, that we're able to identify gang members, we're able to solve murders, we're able to solve rapes, and not enough um, hissing saying, hey, guys, we should, be, we should watch out and we should pay attention. Lastly, the Google Guide quote that was up there that talks mm -hmm. about he sees these like technologies and, and, and AI as being kind of a larger development than fire and electricity. And, electricity. <laughs> um, and that's exactly, again, going back to that book, Technopoly, where he talks about, look, we've always had those instincts that you're talking about. The problem is now is that we are advancing at such a quick pace that our more animal instincts or the natural things that you say haven't adapted along with the technologies that have gone forward. And so we, we've failed to keep up with the technologies. Mm. Yeah, although I think we should resist that one. Yeah. Because the claim that somehow the technology is outpacing us, mm -hmm. right? It sort of gives, it gives technology its own agency. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, if we look at the things that really are, I, I think the most significant things that are happening um, are about uh, the, the, the amount of, of data that we can store, the speed of computation, um, that though, and then and the extent of networking, and the, and those are you know they're very they're very specific developments that have had enormous consequence. Um, but but it is it is really storage capacity, computing speed, and and networking that that is the basis for most of what gets pointed to now as you know AI algorithmic systems, the incredible. Um, advance of technology and so forth. Um, those are all, you know, they're quantitative, they're impressive, but they don't, you know, the thing that, that hasn't developed is the reliance on, on stereotyping, on othering, on, you know, mm. on xenophobia, on those are the, those are the, the things that, that are being amplified mm. by these systems. And that's what I think we really need to be worried about. But, um, you know, but, but never, you know, sort of accept the premise that that technology happens um you know develops on its own it's it's there's got to be a lot of investment mm -hmm. <laughs> political economic etc and and that's very you know that's a very concrete kind of mm -hmm. um uh, requirement for, for all of this. Thank stuff. goodness I could come away with that because at least I got something that'll help me be able to sleep a little bit uh, tonight yeah, Do you, do you have a yeah I, I also wanted to say grassroots efforts on that, towards that way. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, um, I, I wanna end with one thing about the street lights and the investment. So we spent $30 million as a city on these street lights, but there was a news report last Friday where um, a lot of the sensors on the street lights actually don't work. The data costs twice as much as it was supposed to to store, and the city kind of staff is under-equipped to actually understand how to even manage or interpret the data of the street lights. And so what we have is a massive investment. We have a system that's maybe more fragile than it pretends that it is, and we have some ideas about new possible solidarities and ways that we can learn from each other's histories of resisting and re configuring these things that we can move forward with. So thank you so much for the panel. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs>